I can say it is another gemstone tonight, uh, this lecture. Uh, uh, it is well known that nowadays the critical here ultrasound uh, is replacing the stethoscope for the intensivist. You cannot work in the field of ICU without knowing uh, uh, the point of care ultrasound and echocardiography for the critically ill patients. Um, I am so delighted to introduce Dr. Ashraf Tayyar. Dr. Ashraf is a consultant intensivist and the head of ICU and the RT department and uh, um, security forces hospital in the MAM. Uh, Dr. Ashraf is the founder and the director of critical care ultrasound uh, course in the Eastern province and Saudi Arabia. And he is the European Society of Intensive Care uh, Medicine representative uh, in the Middle East. Uh, Dr. Ashraf is gonna present today an important topic about lung ultrasound, why and how. Uh, please go ahead, Dr. Ashraf. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarwat, uh, for this very nice uh, presentation. I'm really honored to be tonight with you. Uh, as Dr. Sarwat mentioned very clearly that critical care ultrasonography is becoming very essential for all working in ICU and lung ultrasound is replacing actually the uh, stethoscope and is considered the stethoscope for the intensivist. Unlike what was believed before that lung ultrasound is difficult to be done because the lung is a major hindrance for the ultrasound and uh, this is because the irrigated lung contains air, will not allow you to see anything. But this is, as it was mentioned in the principle of internal medicine in Harrison textbook, 1992, which is one of the famous, if not the famous uh, textbook for internal medicine. It's mentioned very clearly that you cannot do ultrasound for the lung this is was believed, but then tended to be simply wrong, and evidence is showing that the reverse is right, that the lung can be seen, and a lot of things can be diagnosed, a lot of pathology can be diagnosed very simply, bedside by using lung ultrasonography. And not only that, but also every recommendation from different societies dealing with critical care medicine is nowadays recommending that every ICU, not only ICU, but also every acute medicine area, like OR, ER, plus the ICU has to have a bedside, critical care, point of care, uh, ultrasound machine capable of examining patients when it's really needed. Because the options for ICU patients are very limited when it comes to radiology. Chest X-rays, the most common one used, is in 30% of the cases are suboptimum, and it needs time to request the, the uh, X-ray to be done and for the technician to come and do it, for the film to be uploaded to a system, and then for somebody to read it. It might take time, and it's not optimum. The gold standard is CT, no doubt, but the CT is not without hazards of moving patients from ICU to radiation, to radiology department, as well as the radiation exposure and the expenses of doing CT. And of course, if you need to repeat the exam, you're repeating the same hazards of cost, radiation exposure, moving unstable patients away from ICU. When it comes to lung ultrasonography, there are a lot of advantages. One of them is being a bedside modality that you can drag the machine, put it bedside, do the exam, repeat it after a while, and so on. Plus, no radiation, cheap, easy and fast. And, and not only that, but also one of the most advantageous part of the uh, lung ultrasound is that it's very easy to learn and very easy to practice it and to do it bedside. So also there is a very poor correlation between the chest X-ray and the CT in finding 
uh, common pathologies in, in lung. Technical difficulties with the chest X-ray makes the need for lung ultrasound uh, more mandatory. Patients and thorax are on continuous movement, and this will affect the resolution of the chest X-ray. The filmic acids is placed posterior to the thorax, and the beam will be difficult to be perpendicular to the structure you are aiming to see, especially the copula of the diaphragm bilaterally. And then you're going to have incorrect assessment of pleural effusion, a lot of false negative and false positive interstitial lung syndromes, pneumothorax consolidation, and so on. If I ask you kindly to comment on this plain X-ray, I think you might agree with me that this patient plain X-ray doesn't show maybe any abnormalities. You can see here, you can see here that the bilateral angles are clear totally. Do you expect any consolidation of this lung plain X-ray? And actually, this patient was presenting to ICU with a frank prone picture of sepsis and septic shock. Look, when we did lung ultrasound for this patient, what was there? Actually, this is the right side. You can see clearly here that this is the liver, this is the diaphragm, here is the lung, here is the abdomen, and what we can see here on the right side, although the X-ray did not show that at all, that there is a significant amount of hypoechoic shadow above the diaphragm, which defines clearly the uh, pleural effusion. If you look at the left side, you're gonna see the same. This is what we call it the spine sign above the level of the diaphragm. And here you can see that the lung, which is consolidated, collapsed, sinking inside a pool of pleural effusion. So there was bilateral pleural effusion, consolidation and collapse, and this is what the CT confirmed it totally. You can rely on lung ultrasound to diagnose pneumothorax with a lot of, with, with very high specificity and sensitivity, pleural effusion consolidation interstitial lung syndromes, plus very, very essential to diagnose diaphragmatic weakness and or paralysis. Evidence, ladies and gentlemen, show it that the sensitivity of lung ultrasound in diagnosing pneumothorax, for example, as this meta-analysis is showing, is around 80% with a specificity might reach up to 100%. If you compare this to the sensitivity of the chest X-ray, which is around 40%, you would know that there is around 60% of patients who might present with the normal chest X-ray, they still have pneumothorax. This false negative is around less than 80%, and, um, and in some of the evidence, it is less than maybe 10%. So there is no doubt that lung ultrasound is very superior to chest X-ray in diagnosing pneumothorax. Plural effusion, the sensitivity reach up to 100%, specificity under 100%. This accuracy of the lung ultrasound is totally, totally equal to the accuracy of the CT in diagnosing plural effusion. Not only that, but also interstitial lung syndromes, sensitivity and specificity of lung ultrasound reach up to 100% to diagnose wet interstitium, interstitial lung fibrosis, which is totally equal to CT. In alveolar consolidation, there is very high sensitivity and specificity, reach up to 98%, and in some of the evidence, might go to 100% equal to the CT. You wouldn't miss at all any case of pneumothorax, occult pneumothorax, alveolar consolidation or collapse. That's why we see in international evidence-based recommendations from different societies, as I mentioned before, that it's 1A recommendations in pneumothorax, in effusion, in consolidation collapse, and in interstitial lung syndrome, syndromes. There is a lot of evidence that when you rely on lung ultrasonography, you can save a lot of cost doing unnecessarily plain X-rays in our critically ill patients. This is very clear that when we rely on the lung ultrasound, you save a lot of cost of doing chest X-rays. 
and you're gaining not only cost issues or radiation issues, but you're gaining a lot of benefit in diagnosing common pathologies, again, naming them, but not including all. It, it is pneumothorax, effusion, consolidation, collapse, pneumonia, ERDS, and many other things. To be competent in lung ultrasonography examination and to be very beneficial to your bedside management of your critical ill patients, you have to be competent in acquiring imaging and then to interpret these images, which is very easy, by the way. You, what, what you just need to do is to see the videos, attend some lectures, attend some virtual webinars, uh, virtual courses, or bedside courses when we used to do this before the era of COVID-19. And the evidence is showing that everybody in the field of critical care medicine or acute medicine can learn with ease how to do bedside lung ultrasonography and how to pick up the common pathologies, which I mentioned some of them. This is one of the evidence that in two hours, in two hours teaching ER physicians, they were able to be specific in 100% and reach more than 85% sensitivity. The more they do exams, the more they get sensitivity and specificity in picking up common pathologists on the lung. This is after two hours only. Not only physicians, but also respiratory therapists, nurses, they can also learn how to use the critical care bedside lung ultrasonography point of care. You have to have a specific question in mind, and then you have to have a goal-directed exam to answer these questions. In very simple, straightforward way, yes or no, or I don't know. Again, there are a lot of evidence, a lot of recommendations that this is not luxurious. We have to practice this and we have to learn this because the evidence is showing that to be more safe with your patients in ICU or in acute medicine, in ER for trauma, in OR for uh, OR patients, then it's more safer to use or rely on lung ultrasound in diagnosing common pathologies. If you look for, and your question is gonna be, do you have pathology of the pleura, namely pneumothorax, disease of the pleura with the RDS, with lung, you're gonna go with a vascular probe or high frequency probe. If your question is about the deep parenchyma, if you wanna diagnose if the patient is having pneumonia, effusion, collapse, and many other things, then you're gonna go with low frequency probe. This is, will give you details of the examination of the parenchyma. Usually, we classify the lung into three zones, zone one, two, and three, and this is based on the midline, line, a line on the sternal uh, edge, anterior axillary line, mid axillary line, and posterior axillary line, and then a line at the level of the nipple. Then you go with these three zones, area one, area two in each zone, upper one is area one, the lower segment is area two. So in each uh, loop, in each side of the lung, you're gonna have six areas. In both sides, you're gonna have 12 areas. You can simplify this to just zone one, zone two, zone three. When you look for pneumothorax, you have to go to zone one. When you look for interstitial lung syndromes, then you have to examine zone two or zone three. When it's a pleural effusion question, then you have to go to the posterior or the plaps area, the most posterior area at the level of the posterior axillary line or more. And you have to put in mind that air likes to be up. So pneumothorax, you examine the front of the chest while the fluids like to go with the gravity. So when you look for effusion or interstitial wet lung, you go with the more dependent area posteriorly. And then there are some types of good examination. The first one, you have to insinuate your probe inside the intercostal space because the ultrasound beam doesn't like two enemies, the air and the bone. You have to, ab to avoid the, the bone. And anything you are aiming to see, you have to be perpendicular to it with your beam of ultrasound. So if you're looking to see the diaphragm, and to see the angle of the lung, then you have to be perpendicular to the angle when you go to the posterior axillary line, down to the nipple, 
and then you, you toward your beam of the ultrasound to, to be perpendicular. You have to use gel because the gel will eradicate the effect of air between the skin and the probe. And, and then what you're going to look for commonly is these uh, uh, signs like a sliding, A line, B line, long point, line pulsation, and then the M mode. Let's start with the first thing that we have to look for, which is the bad sign. A shadow of the rib and a shadow of the rib, then you're going to identify the area between two rib shadows, skin and subcutaneous and intercostal space. Down to the rib shadow, bilaterally, you're going to see a hyperechoic line that moves back and forth. This is what you have to identify as the plural line. The three signs of the shadows here and here, and then what you see again in between is the plural line. These three, the two shadows and the hyperechoic line, constitute what we call it the bad sign, as you see here. Then the first thing that you have to comment on is do I have this plural sliding or not? This is again the rib, rib, and this is the plural line. Look at it carefully and see if the visceral layer of the pleura moves back and forth against a fixed layer that is the parietal pleura that does not move with inhalation or inspiration. The entry of the air to this lung will allow the visceral pleura to move against the parietal pleura. I, I hope there is no problem with the sound. So this is the first thing that you have to look for. If you carefully look at uh, to see this, this slide, you're gonna see clearly that the pleura slides back and forth with inhalation. And then if you see sliding, as I mentioned before, where you look for, it has to be the second intercostal space, front of the chest, because if you're looking for pneumothorax, air lags to be up, then this is the area you examine for a sliding. The presence of a sliding indicate that there is no pneumothorax. Look at this slide and tell me, you're going to see clearly that the pleura here, this is the pleural line, does not move back and forth, but it's a fixed, silent pleura, no sliding. When you see no sliding, this is will really indicate pneumothorax in more than 90% of the cases, but it is not a specific 100% because apnea and adhesion of the pleura, presence of intercostal space, intercostal tube, and advanced COPD, and effusion can make the sli sliding absent. So it's a good sensitive. When you see sliding back and forth or shimmering movement of the pleura, there is no pneumothorax 100%. But if you see that the sliding is disappeared, this is, might indicate pneumothorax. Then, the next step is to do M mode. You fire the M mode in the middle of the sliding or non-sliding pleural line, and then you're gonna see what you see here when you fire the M mode. Sky, ocean, beach sign, beach area. The beach area is indicating a sandy long area, and this line is the pleura. Down to the pleura is a sandy area, which is long. This is what you see normally. If you see something like this, when you fire the mood on the middle of the plural line, and you see that every single part of this M mood is like a barcode, so under the plural, the lung is not shown, and it becomes silent like the intercostal space, this is indicate that this plural is not, this area is containing air, which prevent the beam to reach the lung and you did not see the sandy area, you did not see the lung down to the pleura because of presence of air. So this is what you see normally in M mode. And if you don't see this and you see it as barcode, this is assuring that you have pneumothorax. Another very specific and pathognomonic sign of pneumothorax, which is the lung point, the meeting point between the pneumothorax and when the pneumothorax finish and the area of the pleura with no pneumothorax meet the area of pneumothorax. Look at here and look 
where's the 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 uh, area of the this is the no sliding and look at here carefully you're gonna see that the pleura start to slide this is no this is area of pneumothorax and when you started to see the sliding again the pneumothorax stopped here when you fire the mode you're gonna see area of sandy area meeting the area of barcode and here is the lung point which is very pathognomonic for pneumothorax this is the lung point the artifacts which is commonly seen in normal lung is art, are two artifacts number one is a which indicate air and b lines which are indicating the interstitium uh, pathology the a line is a reverberation of the pleural line it is transverse equal to the size of the pleural line so when you see it like this you're gonna see that the reverberation the mirror image of the pleura is equal taking the same space of the intercostal here in the in the ultrasound picture a totally equal to the 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 size of the pleura this is number one number two the distance between the pleural line and the a line is totally equal to the distance between the pleural line and the skin these are the characteristic of the a lines otherwise you wouldn't say that the line down here is a line because the distance between this second line is not e to the pleural line is bigger than the distance between the pleural line and the skin not only that but also if you look carefully you're going to see that this one which is the true a line is totally equal to the size because if you if you yourself stand in front of a mirror you're going to see yourself equal to your actual size if your air, if your mirror mirror is big enough to show your whole body and that's why this is the true a line and the the false a line i mentioned this criteria but i i i, I have to mention also that it's normally to see a line a normal line but also you might see a line in a pneumothorax b lines are vertical lines they are not horizontal they are vertical so they start from the plural line and end by the screen they have to come from the plural line move with the plural line and end by the screen they should not end in the middle or just take a part of the screen this is very important so vertical line two moves with the plural line start from the plural line end by the bottom of the screen this is has also if you see any b line it has to eradicate any a lines so you never see a line with b line if you see b a line which is typical a line the b line are false we call them z line so this is very important to mention this is vertical start from the pleura move with the pleura and it has to end by the at the bottom of the screen and they eradicate totally any a lines normally you can see one or two as you see here or you don't see at all any b lines actually b line represent an artifact or mirror image of the interstitium especially the 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 shadow of the septum between the loops of the lung like the the middle loop and upper loop on the right side middle and lower loop on the right side but actually you can see up to two in one intercostal space normally and normally also you might not see at all any b lines if you see frequent b lines i mean extensive b lines in one intercostal space when you insinuate your probe in one of the intercostal spaces and usually when your question in mind is interstitium then you have to go to the dependent area of the lung mid axillary line or posterior axillary line bilaterally and you see but this is can be done anywhere in the lung if you have extensive pulmonary edema what i want to say that in one intercostal space if you see more than two vertical lines with the characteristics of the b lines then this is this is pathologic indicate that the interstitium is replaced is replaced by wetness by wet 
with, with interstitium because maybe of pulmonary edema, cardiogenic or non-cardiogenic, because of infection, because of contusion, because of tumor, because of fibrosis, whatever is the, the etiology is. But when you see extensive, more than three B lines in one intercostal space, then as you see here, there are many B lines. Look at the plural line, next step. So first, if you see extensive B lines, look at the plural line. This is the plural line here, and this is the plural line here. If you see the pleura is thickened, corrugated, interrupted, not shiny like in here, not smooth, soft like in here, this is ERDS, wet pulmonary edema with diseased pleura indicate that this is pathologic, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It might be ERDS or it might be extensive interstitial lung fibrosis. While when you see the plural line is shiny, smooth, soft, not corrugated, not without, not with any subplural consolidation, with extensive B line as you see here, this is typical straightforward cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Look at this one. This is a rib shadow, and this is a rib shadow, and this is abdominal probe, low frequency probe. This pleura, if you see here, is very thickened, corrugated, interrupted with extensive B-lines, and you would diagnose that this patient has pulmonary edema, but this presence of disease pleura is in favor of ERDS, not cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This is one thing. The second thing is, when you go with pulmonary edema, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, you would see bilateral, equally, evenly distributed B-lines in both lungs, while in ERDS, it is characteristically and diagnostically is going to be unevenly distributed or haphazardly distributed. So you see areas, what we call it, spared area in one lung and also in the other lung. You see area of wet lung, interstitium wet. Uh, beside this area, you might see normal pleura and no, no uh, uh, B lines. If you see sliding, like what you see here, the plural line is here sliding very well, and B lines are here, extensive B lines, presence of B lines, and sliding is 100% against presence of pneumothorax. Again, sliding and B lines together are considered to be totally against presence of pneumothorax. What we mean by lung pulsation? What we mean by lung pulsation is when you see the lung pulsate with, unfortunately, this video is not working, but when you see the lung pulsate with the heart beats, when the heart is beating, the lung is pulsating with each beat of the heart, it means that the heart beats transmitted to this area of the lung. It will not transmit to this area of the lung except if you don't have air. If this air area of the lung, which receive the transmission from the heart beats, is showing beating or pulsation, it means that this area of the lung is non aerated collapsing. And the other thing is, its presence of pulsation is totally, totally, totally against presence of pneumothorax, because if there is air in this part of the lung, the heart beating will not reach the lung on this area because of presence of air. Presence of air will not allow the heartbeat to be transmitted to any segment of the lung. Look at this one video here. You're going to see that this part of the lung is pulsate. This is the left ventricle here, by the way. Not completed because the target was to examine the left lower loop. But when you look carefully here, you're going to see that the heart beating and the lung beats with the heart indicates that this part of the lung, plus it's consolidated, it's also collapsing. So presence of lung pulsation, ladies and gentlemen, indicate no air, so collapsed lung, and no pneumothorax. It's a totally against pneumothorax. There is what we call it curtain sign. When the lung moves at the, the mid-axillary line or the posterior axillary line at the level of liver or the spleen, and then you, you see the pleura comes with inhalation to cover the area of the liver or spleen as if you are opening a curtain and closing it, this is indicate that this part of the lung, the lower loops bilaterally, 
are inflated very well, no pneumothorax and no effusion, and the lung can expand very nicely. You can see here also another example of, of a curtain sign. This is the, uh, a one curtain sign. Look, this is a vascular probe, and this is the lung. This is part of the liver here. This is the diaphragm here. And what you can see as if you are opening and closing the, a curtain, which indicate that there is no significant pathology in this lower loops to prevent the pleura to come and extend to cover part of the liver or part of the spleen. If you look to examine the parenchyma deeply on the lung to, 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 to diagnose presence of consolidation collapse plus effusion, then what you need to do is to go again to the dependent area of the lung bilaterally and you use low frequency probe, either abdominal probe or cardiac probe. There is a very specific and very good sign here, which we call it the spine sign. The spine sign, because the beam of ultrasound can reach up to posteriorly up to the spine at the level of the liver, because the liver or the spleen is a good media for ultrasound to transmit, then the beam can reach more posteriorly till it hit the spine and reflect backward as a shadow. This shadow, hypoechoic shadow here, is a shadow of the spine. When you see the shadow of the spine above the level of the liver and the diaphragm, as you see here, this is, cannot be seen at all if the lower loops bilaterally, either right side or left side, are healthy aerated, you wouldn't see at all the spine shadow because the lung ultrasound beam will be prevented to reach the spine by presence of aerated lung. If the aerated lung on these loops are replaced by disease or pathology, like effusion, consolidation or collapse or tumor, then it will be a good media for the lung ultrasound to be transmitted, hit the spine and comes back. So you see the spine sign shadow above the level of the liver and the frag, this is indicates pathology. Again, sorry for interruption, five minutes remaining, please. Sure, I'm about to land. And before I land, let me confirm what I said in the first few slides that the chest X-ray is totally non-sensitive and non-specific, especially in critically ill patients. Relying on the chest X-ray can cost you a lot of uh, side effects and disadvantages. Look at this chest X-ray and tell me. I think you all guys agreed with me that there is bilateral pleural effusion, which is more on the right side. Actually, I was rounding on this patient when the surgeon was planning to put intercostal tube for this patient who believed to have very significant right pleural effusion. And then this pleural effusion for the treating physician was the explanation for acute hypoxemic respiratory failure. And then I told them, just give me a few, few seconds of, if not very few minutes to, to examine this patient with lung ultrasound to tell you how much effusion there is or there is no effusion here. And what was surprisingly there, that there was no single drop of pleural effusion on this right side. This is the movie, this is the liver, diaphragm, and this is the lung. There is, there is very minimal drops of effusion, but what is there is a hyperechoic lines and dots, which does not disappear with inhalation, characteristically for what you call it, static air bronchogram, and tissue-like structures in the area of the lung is almost like the liver, hepatinized lung. This patient had a collapse and consolidation. And what was needed, this is the left side. Also, there was no single drop, but the lung was wet with several B lines. What was needed here is to connect this patient to positive pressure ventilation with increasing of the PEEP. Every, everything, everything was corrected. This is typical example of what we mean by consolidation collapse in a pool of pleural effusion in this patient. This is the left ventricle and this is the left lung. You can see here air bronchogram and fluid bronchogram. So lung ultrasound can give you what can the CT give you with another advantages of the lung ultrasound beside that it's non-invasive, that it's non-radiation, that is bedside, that is less cost, 
that it's a dynamic finding. You see here a tubes of hypoechoic tubes. This is fluid bronchogram. And there is also a hyperechoic tubes or dots that some of them disappear. A dynamic air bronchogram. Dynamic air bronchogram indicates consolidation. Fluid bronchogram indicates a post-stenotic pneumonia, which needs this patient to change management plan by considering bronchoscopy here because you have to open the collapse and to open maybe obstructed bronchi or bronchioles. And it's very clear that lung ultrasound can show you clearly the effusion, pleural effusion, and you can see the characteristics of the pleural effusion with lung ultrasound. Things that cannot be shown by the CT. Ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of media, a lot of materials, and a lot of videos, a lot of webinars, and YouTube is full of materials for lung ultrasonography, for those who are interested to learn. We are doing virtual courses, and we are doing webinars every now and then. Please, if you have any question, just approach me on LinkedIn, or WhatsApp, or email, or visit our website, uh, Facebook page, Critical Character Sonography, and you can be updated with our activity on lung ultrasonography. Thank you very much, Dr. Sarwat Thank and Dr. the uh, cabin crew. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. That's really brilliant and superb presentation. As usual, it is very comprehensive uh, presentation about lung ultrasound, uh, how and when. Uh, we have some questions for you, Dr. Ashraf, uh, from our attendees. Uh, what about the rule of lung ultrasound in COVID-19 patients? This is from Dr. Noha Abdelohab. Yeah, there is a big, 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 big rule for lung ultrasonography in COVID-19. In pneumonia in general, look at the signs of pneumonia in general. Signs of pneumonia, pneumonia in general, you're going to see consolidation collapse plus minus effusion, disease de pleura, and wet interstitial. Characteristically, in pneumonia of COVID, that most of this finding, you would see them subpleural. So it's peripherally, as the CT is showing, the ground glass or cra crazy bathing characteristic of the CT, you would see this as disease de pleura, wet interstitial, in sort of extensive B lines, that are e unevenly distributed bilaterally. So you see patchy area of the right side, for example, and you see some patches on the left side, you might see more distribution on one side compared to the other side. This is very characteristic of COVID. But again, I have to press on something here, that your safety has to be a priority. Don't do lung ultrasound exam extensively in COVID-19 if this is gonna expose you to infection. You might do this once at the beginning, and then with application of PEEP, you can see if your collapsed area opened in a, a, a very, very cautious way. So advantages of lung ultrasound in COVID-19 ERDS patients, or pneumonia in general, that you can diagnose pneumonia very characteristically. And there are a lot of data on this. And also, it will help you in managing patients on, on ventilator to see if you need to increase the PEEP and to open the collapsed area or not. There is very characteristic signs and signs for consolidation and collapse on the lung. And again, it can give you what the CT cannot give you, the dynamicity of the views. You see the lung with your eyes moving back and forth, the sliding back and forth, the consolidation, air bronchogram, static and, and, and dynamic the fluid bronchogram, static, the, the dynamic air fluid bronchogram, and many, many things like the effusion, how much you need, how much do you have effusion, do you need to tap it or not? And in the process of the weaning from mechanical ventilation, do not forget, and this will be the next presentation, after four days, I guess, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to see how you use critical character sound, diaphragmatic examination to help in deciding when to wean patients from mechanical ventilation. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Another question from Dr. Mahfouz. Uh, Dr. Mahfouz saying, I'm a consultant, anesthetist running a busy ICU and teaching the trainee at the same time. 
do you examine each patient separately with both clinical and the ultrasound exam at the same time? Or what do you do in your facility? Very good question. Yeah. Lung ultrasound as any critical care, point of care, ultrasonography has to be put on the context of clinical scenario, history, physical examination, laboratory. And then you confirm what you believe on, your diagnosis can be confirmed by the ultrasonographic exam. What we want to say that we are not replacing our clinical judgment, history and physical examination by doing a test or study by lung ultrasound machine. But what we, are, we want to stress on, that the part of radiology, among the many parts for diagnosing patients' diseases, that you can replace the chest X-ray and CT by bedside portable machines to give you the same, if not better, data from the lung ultrasound compared to CT and chest X-ray. But again, this should not preclude your clinical, physical, and laboratory judgment of patients. Why I'm saying that? Because you might see consolidation and not every consolidation is pneumonia. It might be contused lung. It might be post-pneumonic changes that stays while the patient is improving. So it has to be put in the context of clinical and laboratory and everything you use to diagnose at the end of the day. Brilliant. Another question from, actually it is two questions. Um, for uh, ultrasound picture in pulmonary embolasma, Dr. Taisir is asking also in relation to pulmonary embolasma. Is lung ultrasound can replace pulmonary angiography in the diagnosis of pulmonary embolasma? If you have unstable patients to move to CT, then the integrated critical care ultrasonography can be a replacement for moving patients to radiology suite if they are unstable. How you diagnose pulmonary embolism, history and physical, and then you're gonna do echo exam, heart examination. You're gonna see evidence of RV, strain, pressure, and dilation. And then you see that the peripherally, the lung is oligemic, and you might see area of infarction with disease diplora and subpleuric consolidation with regular borders, that this is infarcted peripheral infarction of the lung, plus, in part of the integrated critical character sonography is to go for lower limb vessels and you might see a thrombus. If you have the clinical context and the scenario is matching with pulmonary embolism and you have this finding together, RV failure or RV strain that's acute with oligemic, peripherally oligemic lung and you might see area of infarction and a DVT, the scenario is matching diagnosis of pulmonary embolism. And we have cases like this. We thrombolized them based on the history, examination, scenario, and evidence of bedside critical care ultra integrated, many parts of critical care ultra -snobber. Yes. That's perfect. Uh, last question for Dr. Ashraf. Is there any accurate method to estimate the volume of uh, plural effusion by ultrasound? Yeah, there is. Yeah, and this is another big advantage big advantage of the lung ultrasound over the CT that you accurately, more, maybe more accurately than the CT, you estimate the size of the pleural effusion. Simply, you go to the mid axillary or posterior axillary line, perpendicular to the copula of the diaphragm, and you see the copula of the, of, you see the diaphragm over the spleen or over the, the, the liver, and then freeze the image at the end of expiration and measure the separation distance. You put a dot at the, the diaphragm area and the dot at the, the visceral part of the lung. The separation distance in millimeter can be multiplied by 20 and this will give you roughly in more than 80% accuracy, the volume of the pleural effusion. And we have a study comparing the visual assessment with the ultrasonographic assessment, an actual drainage bag volume, and it was almost near to the real life. That's perfect. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Uh, as usual, this is very uh, superb presentation. Thank you very much.